In this lecture, we continue our look at vessel functions. Now, in the previous lecture, we attacked the Helmholtz equation in cylindrical coordinates by the method of separation of variables. And what we ended up with was the following equation. Y double prime plus 1 over x, y prime plus 1 minus nu squared over x squared, y is equal to 0. And that's called Bessel's equation. And we even looked at the asymptotic behavior of the solutions of this equation in the limits x goes to 0 and x goes to infinity. And so we saw that as x goes to 0, the solutions, the two linearly independent solutions, must behave as 1 as x to the nu and the other as x to the minus nu. So if nu is a positive number, the first solution would be well behaved at x equal to 0, while the second would have a singularity that would blow up there. So we already know a little bit of something about the behavior of the functions. And we also looked at the limiting case as x goes to infinity, and we saw we got behavior that looks something like either sine or cosine over the square root of x, or a linear combination of those. We know something about these functions already to begin. Now, this is an equation of the form y double prime plus p of x y prime plus q of x y is equal to zero. And we discussed in a previous lecture how to solve those kinds of equations with power series. But in this case, the p of x and q of x are not well-behaved analytic functions at x is equal to zero, but they blow up. 1 over x and 1 over x squared both blow up to infinity at x is equal to zero. However, x times p of x and x squared times q of x are well-behaved analytic functions for all values of x. They are just 1 and x squared minus nu squared, so simple polynomials. Well, that means we need to use the method of Frobenius to solve this. And in the method of Frobenius that we reviewed in an earlier lecture, we write our solution y in the form of x to the r, where r is an arbitrary number, not necessarily an integer, times a normal power series, n equals 0 to infinity, a sub n, x to the n. And without loss of generality, we require that a0 is not equal to 0. Because if it was, say, a0 was equal to 0, and the first non-zero coefficient was a sub 1, so the first term here would be a1 x to the 1, we could just take that factor of x and move it out front and, and call this x to the r plus 1, and then r would just become r plus 1, and then the first term here would have an x to the 0 power, and we could just relabel the coefficient so that the first coefficient was a sub 0. So there's no loss of generality in requiring that a0 is not equal to 0. So we take this equation plug it in to the Bessel equation, uh, we take this expression rather, and plug it into the Bessel equation, and solve for the power r and the coefficients a sub n. Now it's most convenient to do that if we take Bessel's equation and multiply through by x squared to get rid of denominators there, of fractions, and so we get x squared y double prime plus x y prime plus x squared minus nu squared y is equal to 0. So we need expressions for um, y prime and y double prime. And what are those? Well, it's most convenient to bring this factor x to the r inside the summation and combine it with the x to the n. So write y is equal to the sum n equals 0 to infinity a sub n x to the r plus n, and then y prime. We just use the power rule for derivatives. 
it would bring down the exponent r plus n times a n x to the r plus n minus one and then um y double prime we would do the power rule again and that'd bring down the exponent r plus n times r plus n minus one a sub n x to the r plus n minus two so there are the three forms that we need to plug in to this equation and notice for the first term here we'll have an x squared times y double prime well that x squared can be brought in and it will just get rid of this x to the minus two right there and for x y prime well we can bring in that factor of x to get rid of this x to the minus one factor there and so doing that what we end up with is the sum n equals zero to infinity and so here from the y, the y double prime we'll have let's write it this way um r plus n times r plus n minus one times a sub n but we got some other a sub n a sub n terms so we'll factor that out here and we'll get x to the r plus n and with no minus two because we multiply by the x squared Okay, so for the y prime term, we'll get r plus n, a sub n, so that'll be plus r plus n, then times a sub n, x to the r plus n. Again, the minus one goes away because of this factor. And then for the minus new squared, well, we'll get minus new squared times a sub n, x to the r plus n. Okay, so for, for this term, that term, and the minus new squared y term, there is a complete summation over all terms. Now for the x squared y term, well that's gonna take this expression and it's just gonna add two to the exponent. So we get plus n equals zero to infinity, a sub n, x to the r plus n plus two, and then all that has to add up to zero. So that's the equation that we have to solve. Now it's convenient to change this index here so that it has the same power of x, easier to combine these. So we're gonna just subtract two from n. So that will replace this by summation where we have a sub n minus two, x to the r plus n minus two plus two, so x to the r plus n. And now the summation must start at, well, the first coefficient is a sub zero here, so it still has to be a sub zero down here, and that means that n would have to start at two. n is equal to two to infinity. So with those manipulations, we now dig into the problem of solving for the power r and the coefficients a sub n. So notice um, that this summation starts at n is equal to two and this starts at n is equal to zero. So for the first two n values, uh, we'll only get contributions from this term here. And remember that the co total coefficient of every power of x on the left has to be equal to zero because the whole thing is equal to zero. And so for this to be true for all values of x, the coefficient of every power of x must be equal to zero. So let's look at the case n is equal to zero. What do we get over here on the left? So that this term doesn't have any contribution for n is equal to zero, all right? That would be the x to the r power. And so here we would get well, let's see, r plus zero, r plus zero minus one, so that would be r times r minus one plus r plus zero plus r minus nu squared times a zero is equal to zero. And we said a zero is not equal to zero, and therefore this factor must be equal to zero. And what is that? Well, here's r squared minus r plus r, those cancel. So we just leave r squared minus nu squared. 
And of course, that means that bar must be plus or minus nu. And that's precisely what we know must be the case, because we already worked out the behavior of the solutions of this equation as x gets really small, and there they were had the form x to the nu and x to the minus nu. And so that means over here in this equation, the lowest power of, of x is x to the r, and it must be either r must be nu or minus nu. Okay, so that makes sense. How about for n is equal to 1? What do we get? Again, this second term here doesn't have an n is equal to 1, an x to the r plus 1 power. So we still over here have this, this expression. It's got to be equal to 0. So this would be r plus 1 times r plus 1 minus 1, or just r, plus r plus 1 minus nu squared times a1 is equal to 0. So how can that be equal to 0? Well, an easy case would be that a1 is equal to 0. Or if a1 is not equal to 0, then this has to be equal to 0. And what is this? This is, well, let's see. This is r plus 1 times r plus r plus 1 times 1. That means if we factor out an r plus 1 from those two terms, we get r plus 1 times r plus 1, or r plus 1 squared minus nu squared is equal to 0. But we already know that r is plus or minus nu. So this is plus or minus nu plus 1 squared um, minus nu squared is equal to 0. And that has two solutions. Nu is plus or minus a half. Now, we also, in the previous lecture, saw that we could get a simple exact solution to Bessel's equation in this case, nu is equal to plus or minus a half. The solutions were sine x over square root of x and cosine x over square root of x. So we've already solved this case. So if we have nu is plus or minus a half, we wouldn't even be doing this whole method of Frobenius thing because we already have an exact elementary solution. So this will be not so in all the cases we're interested in, and therefore we must have a1 is equal to 0. Now, now we start at n is equal to 2 and higher powers, and now this term kicks in. And so what's going to happen? The total coefficient of x to the r plus n is going to be this term plus a n minus 2, and they have to sum to 0. And that means then that a n here must be equal to minus a n minus 2. Right? So, so this whole coefficient there plus this guy must be equal to 0. So move this to the other side, get some minus sign, and then divide by this coefficient. Now, what is this coefficient? Let's do a little uh, manipulation there along the lines of what we did down here. This is r plus n times r plus n minus 1 plus r plus n times 1. Factor out an r plus n, it would be r plus n times r plus n minus 1 plus 1. That is r plus n times itself, or r plus n squared and then minus nu squared. Now, notice that will allow us, if we have a0, then that will allow us to get a2, and a2 will allow us to get a4, and etc. We leapfrog over all the odd subscript coefficients. And we know that a1 is equal to 0. So a1 is equal to 0, but then this recursion would tell us that a3 would be 0, and a3 would tell us that a5 would be equal to 0, and so on. And so all the odd coefficients are 0. So there are only even subscript coefficients, only even values of n. So let's take a look at this r plus n squared minus nu squared. We know that r is plus or minus nu. So let's expand that out. 
that would become r squared plus 2rn plus n squared minus nu squared. But r squared is equal to nu squared. So this would be equal to, well, let's factor out an n. We'd have n times n plus 2r. And now n is always, for the non-zero uh, coefficients, is n is always an even integer. So we'll write that n is equal to 2 times k. And therefore, this becomes 2 times k times 2 times k plus 2 times r. And that'll be 2 times 2 is 4 times k times uh, k plus r. But, all right. And r, remember, is equal to plus or minus nu. And so let's start out with the r is equal to plus nu solution again. And this is the one that's going to be well behaved at x is equal to 0, where the behavior will be x to the nu. And so we will have then for this recursion, we'll have a sub 2k will be equal to minus a sub n minus 2 becomes a sub 2k minus 2 over 4k k plus r. But r, we're doing the case where r is equal to nu. So that would be our recursion for this solution, the solution that's well behaved at x is equal to zero. And we're gonna make the choice for a zero, right? a zero is an arbitrary constant here. We're gonna choose it to be one over two to the nu times nu factorial. And here's where that generalized factorial function comes into play. Okay. So with that, we're going to look at what the actual coefficients are, the form of the coefficients are that we get then, knowing that a0 will determine a2, a2 will determine a4, and etc. So we start off with our choice of a0 is equal to 1 over 2 to the new new factorial. And then we have the recursion formula that a sub 2k is equal to minus a sub 2k minus 2 over 4k k plus nu. And this is for the x to the nu solution, by which we mean the solution that for small values of x behaves as x to the nu. So let's see, k is equal to one, we get a sub two is equal to, and this we get a minus one over, um, k is equal to one, so that would be four times one times one plus nu. So four times one plus nu, and then times a zero, which is one over two to the nu, nu factorial which is, we get a minus one in the numerator. And down below, we can write this as um, one plus nu times nu factorial is one plus nu factorial. So that's one plus nu factorial. We've got two to the nu times two squared. So that's two to the nu plus two. Okay, so that becomes our coefficient. And then a sub 4, it's going to be a minus 1. k is equal to 4. So it will be, um, uh, I'm sorry, k is equal to 2, because 2k is equal to 4. So 4 times k is 8. And then we'll have 2 plus nu. 
and then times this previous coefficient, which is minus one over one plus new factorial to new plus two. Of course, the minus ones, the product is just one. And let's see, two plus new times one plus new factorial. Well, that's two plus new factorial. And then here we've got um, two to the two to the three. And I'm going to take a factor of four out of that, which is two squared, and then this becomes two to the new plus four. All right, two 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 squared. And here's another two squared, so that's two to the new plus four. And that leaves then a factor of two, which I'm gonna write as two factorial. Okay, how about a sub six? Well, that's gonna be minus one over, let's see, so now k will be equal to three. That'll be four times, Four times three, what that here? Three plus new, k plus new, times this previous coefficient, which is one over two factorial, two plus new factorial, two to the new plus four. And that will be minus one, of course, one times minus one is minus one. And let's see. We'll have here, here's a three times a two factorial, that'll be a three factorial. And here's a three plus new times two plus new factorial, that's three plus new factorial. Then we've got two to the new um, times four, right, which is two squared. So that'll be two to the new plus six. And if you continue on in this case, you get the general result that a sub 2k is equal to minus 1 to the k, so they alternate even and odd, over k factorial, k plus new factorial, 2 to the new plus 2k. So in this case, k was equal to 3. In this case, k was equal to 2. Right, and then two to the new plus two k. So those are our, that's the general form of our coefficient. And therefore, we now have our solution and we're gonna call it j sub nu of x. And we're gonna write it in the following form. Remember that in this case, right, our x to the r, we're doing the case where r is equal to plus nu. And notice here, we've got a two to the new factor always in these coefficients. So we're gonna pull that out and combine it with the x to the new. All right, so if we take this x to the new over two to the new, that of course would be x over two to the new. So we will have that factor out in front. We'll have x over two, the new, and then we've got the sum over all k values. Remember, n is equal to 2k. We've got minus 1 to the k over k factorial, k plus new factorial, and now this 2 to the 2k, we're going to combine with the x to the n, which is x to the 2k, and write that as x over two to the two k. And so there's the, that gives you two to the two k. And of course we have then x to the n, which is x to the two k. And so that is our first solution, which is the well-behaved at, at x is equal to zero solution. And we call that vessel function of the first kind of order new.
Now, does that converge? Remember, a solution like this is useless if it doesn't converge. Well, we can see down here in the denominator, we've got a factor of two factorial functions. The factorials grow ultimately larger than any power of x. So it's pretty clear from this that this will converge for all values of x. It's an, we call it an entire function. This power series defines it for all values of x. It's a well-behaved function with no singularities. So that was the solution for r is equal to plus nu. The other solution would have r is equal to minus nu. Well, we could do exactly the same sequence of steps, just with nu replaced by minus nu. There's really nothing different. So we would get j sub minus nu of x would be x over 2 to the minus nu sum k equals 0 to infinity minus 1 to the k over k times k minus nu, sorry, k factorial, times k minus nu factorial, x over 2 to the 2k. And that would be the Bessel function of the first kind of order minus nu. And of course, we can see that behaves for small values of x is x to the minus nu. All right, so this is the x to the nu behavior near x is equal to zero, and this is the x to the minus nu. And these would be two, in general, linearly independent solutions. And so we could form a general solution as, say, a j nu of x plus b j sub minus nu of x. Is the general solution. Okay. Now, there's a problem though. If nu is equal to an integer, a subtle problem. So this first expression, no problem, it works just, just fine. Just replace nu by an integer. But in this equation, look at the denominator. We would have k minus nu factorial. So if nu is equal to m is an integer, what can we say about k minus m factorial? Well, we know that the factorial function for negative integers blows up. And so this goes to either plus or minus infinity for k less than m. If k is less than m, then k minus m is a negative integer, and it blows up. And so the terms then become something over infinity. They go away. They get wiped out. And that means that this summation, all the terms k is equal to 0 up to m minus 1 would get wiped out. And therefore, we would have the following. j sub minus m of x would be x over 2 to the minus m. The sum k equals has to start at m because that's where you'd have m minus m is 0 factorial is equal to 1. That's not a problem. So the summation would start at k is equal to m to infinity minus 1 to the k over k factorial, k minus m factorial, x over 2 to 2k. Two However, if we just make the change of variable, call k is equal to m plus n, right? So k starts at m and goes up to infinity. So in this case, that means n would be k minus m would start at 0 and go up to infinity. And if you make that, that change, so k is m plus n, so k minus m is just m uh, plus n minus m is just n, 
and then k, of course, because n plus n, this then becomes x over 2 to the, well, let's see. So this starts um, x to the, x over 2 to the 2k would be x over 2, 2k would be 2m plus 2n. And that x to the 2m, x over 2 to the 2m would combine with this x over 2 to the minus m to get you a 2m minus m is plus m. And then you would have a sum, n would start at 0. And we would have minus 1 to the k is minus 1 to the m times minus 1 to the n. So you get a minus 1 to the n. And out in front, you'd have a minus 1 to the m. And then you'd have over k minus m would just be n, so that'd be n factorial, and k would be m plus n, so n plus m factorial, and then x over 2 to the 2n, because we wrote 2k as 2n, so that's this guy, plus 2m, and that x over 2 to the 2m, we combine with the x over 2 to the minus m to get this term. Now if you look at that, that is precisely minus 1 to the m, times jm of x, right? It's just this expression with k replaced by n and nu is equal to m. So in the case where nu is an integer, these two functions actually are not linearly independent. The, the j to the minus m just is minus one times j to the m because of that uh, singularity of the factorial function for negative integer values. So we got a problem. So what do we do? So we have a problem. When nu is an integer, j to the minus m is just minus 1 to the m times j plus m of x. So we don't have linearly independent solutions. And so in this case, the Frobenius method says we have to look for a second solution, which we'll call y sub m of x, of the form the log of x times our first solution, j sub m of x, plus a Frobenius type solution, x to the minus m, sum k equals 0 to infinity, um, b sub k, x to the k, a new power series there. So that's the formal form of the second solution for the Frobenius method. If the two solutions, uh, r is plus nu and r is minus nu, are not linearly independent. So we have to plug that in to the, the equation and crank through and get the uh, coefficients, the b sub k coefficients. Now, that would mean that we have, if nu is not equal to an integer m, then our solutions would be j sub nu of x and j sub minus nu of x. But if nu is equal to an integer, then our solutions would be j sub m of x. That's no problem. But now, the second one would be y sub m of x. And that's kind of awkward to have to change the, the two functions you use depending on whether this parameter nu is an integer or not. And so instead, what we do is we define y sub nu of x, the second solution. We have the form j sub nu of x times cosine nu pi minus j sub minus nu of x over the sine of nu pi. And we call this the Bessel function of the second kind. Of order nu. 
And notice that this definition, if nu is not an integer, then that's fine because a sine of nu pi would not be zero. And this would just be a linear combination of j nu and j minus nu. And so that would be linearly independent of j sub nu of x. So that would work. And of course, as nu goes to an integer, we have a problem because this is the denominator becomes sine of m pi, which is zero. And in the numerator, right, j minus m is minus one to the m j m. And this cosine of m pi is minus one to the m. So this becomes minus one to the m j m of x minus the same thing. So this, this goes to a zero over zero form as nu goes to an integer. So in that case, we would have to put in here the limit as nu goes to m to define to get our y sub m of nu, and it should agree with this form that we would use for the Frobenius method. So how do you actually calculate that limit? It's a zero over zero form, so we have to use the Frobenius, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, uh, L'Hopital's rule. So y sub m of x would be then, we'd have to look at, in the denominator, we take a de derivative of this with respect to nu, and that would give us pi times cosine of uh, nu pi. And in the numerator, we'd have to take derivatives with respect to nu of the numerator. And let's see. So the derivative of the cosine would be minus pi times the sine of nu pi, but sine of nu pi as nu goes to m goes to zero. We already said, right? This guy goes to zero. So that would just leave the derivative with respect to nu of j sub nu of x to the minus one to the m, because cosine of m pi is minus one to the m, minus the derivative with respect to nu of j sub minus nu of x. And so that would be then the, uh, and, and technically it would be the, the limit as, as nu, let me put that in there, as nu goes to m of that. That's pretty nasty, but uh, in principle you can go through and do those calculations. Notice um, just kind of roughly back of the envelope here, j sub nu Right, the lowest order term behaves as x to the nu, and if we look at the derivative with respect to nu of x to the nu, what is it? It's x to the nu times the log of x. So there's that log of x behavior that we expect to get in our y sub m function. Okay, however you do that, right? If you take this these derivatives, it's pretty messy, but you can you can do it and do all the bookkeeping, which we're not we are not going to do. I'm just going to write down the result. Y sub m of nu is equal to two over pi times the constant gamma plus the log of x over two times j m of x minus one over pi times x over two to the minus m times a finite sum, k is equal to zero to m minus one, m minus k minus one factorial over k factorial, x over two, the two k, and then an infinite summation, minus one over pi, x over two, Right, and the one over pi comes from this, this, this pi right there. <laughs> x over two to the m times the sum k equals zero to infinity minus one to the k over k factorial k plus m factorial times a constant hk plus a constant hk plus m times x over two to the two k, okay, big ugly expression there. Where, 
gamma is a constant called Euler's constant, 0 0.5772 and so on, irrational number. And the constant h sub k is 1 plus a half plus a third plus and so on up to plus 1 over k, where h sub 0 is equal to 0. Okay, so that's a, that's a mess, but if you actually want to calculate y sub m of nu, there is the series solution. And of course, this, this term has an infinite number of terms, so you'd have to truncate it, and you'd have to look at the, what the error would be and, and all that. So it's not, not a trivial problem. But let's look at the overall behavior. Right Here is a positive value, uh, positive power of x, and this is all positive, non-negative powers of x. So this guy would not have any singularities. and uh, this one here could have singularities, x to the minus m, and then this has a logarithmic term. So even if m was equal to zero, this term goes away. You still get that log x type of behavior. So all these functions are singular at x is equal to zero. So the process of actually writing a, a function, a computer code to evaluate the Bessel functions is, is quite an art. Um, in Scilab, you've got Bessel J of new X and Bessel Y of new X. That's in Scilab. And in Maxima, almost identical, but you just have an underscore before the J or the Y. So you can readily evaluate these functions in computer code and get values. So let's look at a, at a couple plots of what these functions actually look like. So here are plots of j0 of x and y0 of x. So here's j0 of x should behave as x to the 0, which is 1, as indeed it does, x goes to 0. And the y0 should have logarithmic type behavior, and it means it goes off to infinity, but rather slowly, like a, like a logarithm, which would go to minus infinity at x is equal to 0. And then they, kind of, they oscillate, and they kind of look like, sort of like cosines and sines, um, which... Uh, have an amplitude that, that drops off as x gets bigger. And over here is j5 and y5. So here j5 starts off looking like x to the fifth, so very flat. It comes up and then goes into this oscillatory type of behavior. And y5 looks like x to the minus 5. So it goes off quite rapidly down to minus infinity and comes up. And then they both have this kind of oscillatory behavior with a decaying amplitude. And you get similar results for other other orders of these two functions. So the, the j function is well behaved at the x equals zero value, whereas the y functions have singularities there. So now let's talk about the asymptotic behavior of these functions. As x goes to zero, we can be more specific now because we actually have the exact uh, forms of the solutions. Here is the behavior. J0 is a special case. J0 of x, we saw a plot, it behaves just as 1. Y0 of x behaves as 2 over pi times a constant gamma, Euler's constant, plus log x over 2 times j0 of x, but j0 of x behaves as 1. So that's the behavior as x goes to 0 of j0 and y0. And then for arbitrary orders not equal to 0, j nu behaves as 1 over nu factorial x over 2 to the nu, and y nu behaves as minus nu minus 1 factorial over pi times 
x over 2 to the minus nu. So there's the expected x to the nu behavior for one of the functions and x to the minus nu for the other, and then the special case where nu is equal to 0. As x goes to infinity, from the last lecture, we saw that the, the function should behave as sine or cosine of x over the square root of x, or some linear combination. And a detailed analysis shows that j sub nu of x is asymptotic to square root of 2 over pi x. There's the 1 over square root of x behavior times the cosine of x minus 2 nu plus 1 times pi over 4. So with a phase shift there and a constant, it behaves like it, cosine of x over square root of x. And y sub nu of x behaves as the same expression, but with a sign. So let's take a look at that. So here we have, for x between 10 and 40, j5 of x, the solid blue curve, and the dash red curve is square root of 2 over pi x, cosine of x minus 11 pi over 4, which is the asymptotic form. You can see they're starting to get really close together. And as the farther out you go, larger values of x, the closer these two functions become. And then over here, you've got y5 of x in blue, and dashed red is square root of 2 over pi x sine of x minus 11 pi over 4. And again, they become closer and closer, and that is the asymptotic behavior of the j and the y functions. And so the only difference for the different orders, right? so in this case it's m is equal to 5, but for an arbitrary value of nu, the only difference will be this phase factor. Instead of minus 11 pi over 4, it'll be minus 2 nu plus 1 times pi over 4. So you'll just get a phase shift, but all of the Bessel functions will have this same cosine or sine over the square root of x type of behavior as x gets very large. Now let's look at a couple of useful identities. These can be derived by manipulating the Frobenius form solutions for the j nu and y nu functions. One looks like this, b sub nu plus 1 of x, where b can be either a j or a y, is equal to 2 nu over x times b nu of x minus b nu minus 1 of x. So that says if I know, for example, if I knew b0 and b1, I could calculate b2 in terms of those two known functions. So if you're looking at, right, and so this is where b is equal to j, either j or y. So if I knew j0 and j1, I could calculate j sub m just from this recursion. And then a, another very useful one is that b nu prime, the derivative of either j nu or y nu, is equal to one half b nu minus one of x minus b nu plus one of x. So this is very useful because if we need to evaluate the derivative of a Bessel function, we can do it in terms of Bessel functions, not have to have a separate function for that. Another identity that comes up uh, in several electromagnetics problems, especially in scattering and radiation, is this identity. J sub m of x is equal to 1 over pi, the integral from 0 to pi of cosine x sine theta minus m theta d theta. Very interesting result. Um, there's an extension for non-integer values that includes another integral to infinity, and there are some even more complicated forms that are related to the y function, but this is a very, very useful one, uh, as I mentioned in uh, antenna theory, for example. 
Now we're also gonna look at some alternate forms of the Bessel functions. If we take J nu of X plus or minus the imaginary unit J Y nu of X, and we look at the behavior as X gets very large, well, we know that J and Y have behavior at root two over pi X and times cosine, in the first case, the cosine x minus 2 nu plus 1 times pi over 4. And then that would be plus or minus j. And for the y nu, it looks like sine of x minus 2 nu plus 1 times pi over 4. And of course, cosine of theta plus or minus j sine of theta looks like e to the plus or minus j theta. So this looks like the square root of 2 over pi x of e to the plus or minus j x minus 2 nu plus 1 times pi over 4. And that is very useful if you're trying to describe radiated fields, so fields that are propagating in the x direction, which would be in cylindrical coordinates, would actually be the rho direction, propagating radially outward. So like an antenna property of radiation. These functions, these forms of these combinations of the j and the y's are very, very useful. And so we give those their, their own names. We define h nu 1 of x to be the first form, j nu of x plus j y nu of x, and h nu 2 of x to be the conjugate form, j nu of x minus j y nu of x. And we call those the Hankel functions. Of course, they're simply linear combinations of the two linearly independent solutions of Bessel's equation, so they're just other solutions of Bessel's equation. But they have this form, especially this asymptotic form, that is very useful in scattering and radiation type problems. Now, another useful form of the Bessel functions comes kind of by analogy when we talked about the dielectric covered ground plane. We saw that if we, we had, say, a solution that looked like e to the minus j beta y y, and beta y was actually imaginary was minus j alpha y, then that solution became e to the minus alpha y y. It became an exponentially decaying solution. And that allowed us to have fields that were unbounded in space, but their actual power distribution was bounded uh, in space. And so we get a similar thing for Bessel functions. And this becomes now the so-called modified Bessel functions of the first and second kinds of order nu. And these are i nu of x is equal to j to the nu times j sub nu of minus j x. So it's a, basically a Bessel function evaluated at an imaginary argument. And the second kind, which is particularly useful, k sub nu of x is pi over two minus j nu plus one times the Henkel function, h sub nu two, evaluated at minus jx. And these have asymptotic behavior as x gets very large of, in the first case, it's one over square root of two pi x times e to the x, so that exponentially grows. And in the second case, it's square root of pi over two x e to the minus x. And that one is particularly useful for describing fields that decay exponentially. And so, for example, in fiber optics cable analysis, 
which is kind of a cylindrical version of the dielectric covered ground plane, uh, these functions are very, very important. So those are some variations on the Bessel functions. And another variation comes up in spherical coordinates, and these are called the spherical Bessel functions. Little j sub n of x is square root of pi over 2x times big J n plus a half. So this is a half integer order Bessel function. And little y of x is similar expression, but with the y, y sub n plus a half of x. So these come up in, these are called the spherical Bessel functions. And they come up in spherical coordinates. So we'll see them later in the course. And we've already said, stated that the half integer order Bessel functions are actually elementary functions. So for example, j zero, little j zero of x is just sine x over x. Little y zero of x is minus the cosine of x over x. And then for uh, higher orders, so like little j one, uh, one, two, three, et cetera, are just more complicated expressions of this form. And in fact, we had that recursion formula for the big J and big Y, and that same thing works for the little j and little y, and that would be little b sub n plus one of x is equal to two n plus one over x, little b n of x minus little b n minus one of x, where little b is either little j or little y. And you can see then if you start off with the first two, j, j zero and j one, uh, then you can build up the higher order functions. And they're just gonna be linear combinations of these elementary functions. So these, these functions actually, you don't need the power series, they're just in terms of sines and cosines and powers of x, very nice. And finally, we look at the problem of calculating the zeros of the Bessel functions. So although the Bessel functions are generally oscillatory, oscillatory, I guess, um, they're not like sines and cosines, which are periodic. They are aperiodic functions. So finding the zeros is not as simple as just like saying sine of, of n pi is equal to zero, a little more complicated. Uh, but in applications where we're trying to match boundary conditions at cylindrical surfaces, we often have to solve problems that look like this. Say J sub M of beta sub rho times A, where A is a, a radius of some cylinder, where we're trying to impose boundary conditions. That's got to be equal to zero. Or for other modes, it might be J M prime beta rho A is equal to zero. And of course, that means we've got to find the values of x where jm of x is equal to zero, or jm prime of x is equal to zero. And then that value of x is equal to beta rho a, and we know a, so we divide x over a, and that is the value of the propagation constant beta rho. So how do we do that? Um, so there are tables of these, and there's a reference in the PDF notes uh, to a place where you can look those values up, or we could also use a program like Scilab to do this, uh, to solve for these. So let's take a look at that. So here's some simple Scilab code. We define a function y equals f of x, which is one of the Bessel functions, in this case, the j sub two of x. And we take some x values, say from zero to 15, and we plot it. We can just see the function and then we can, here we have a grid on there. So we can see there's a zero at about x equals five, a little more than x equals eight and about x equals what, 12. And so then we can do this, display f solve, oops, f solve. So the first zero was around five. It's function f of x we wanna look at. And then the next zero we said was around uh, eight. And the third one was around, what did we say? It was around uh, 
12. And so running those, this will spit out the zeros of j sub 2 of x, 5.13, etc., 8.417, 11.691. If we want to look at the zeros of the derivatives, say, of this function, well, then we would use the formula that the derivative of j2 of x is the difference of j1 of x and j3 of x divided by 2. Won't change the zero, but we can do that there. To, and now we can run, oops, uh, Bessel j, oops, minus, sorry, I forgot my minus sign. Okay, and there, so there's, let's start that over so we don't have two plots there. So it looks like there's a zero at about uh, three and a zero at about, uh, let's say seven and a zero at about uh, what, 10. I'll have to change the values we already had there. So there's, there are the three zeros of the derivative of J2. And if we wanted to look at the uh, second type kind of Bessel functions, the Bessel y, say 2x, well, in this case, uh, right, this is singular, so this thing's going to blow up. So we want to start this series of x values at something bigger than 0, say 2. So there's j, y sub 2 of x. So it would have a 0 at about uh, 3. And another one at about uh, about seven, and a third one at about about ten. So, and there there would be the zeros then of the y sub two of, of x. Okay, so that's how you can get those zeros if you need them to solve boundary conditions.